take your Bibles, if you would, and open them to Acts 18. Today we're starting a brand new series. And uh, it's a series that's going to take us through the third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. We're calling it Church on the Move. Because that's what our in-gathering project is all about. It's the Church on the Move. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it's the key verse to the book of Acts. It really gives us an outline to the book. When Jesus says, you're to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria... And to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Paul's missionary journeys were the first step of the gospel going to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now when you kind of just compare those three journeys, the first journey of Paul found in Acts 13 and 14 covered about 1400 miles. The second journey of Paul, Acts 15 through 18, about 2800 miles. And the third journey that we're going to look at in this series, about 2,700 miles. Now, in the past, I have preached series that have taken us from Paul before he got saved, when he was known as Saul of Tarsus, all the way through the second journey. Those series are on our church website, myefree.org. The first series is called Paul, and that goes from his pre-conversion through his first journey. The second series is called Road Trip, and that took us on the second journey. So if you would like to go back, in total, those two series are close to 20 messages. If you would like to go back and kind of review or get caught up on all that happened in Paul's life, all the way through his second journey, you can do that. After the first of the year, I'm going to do another series called The Long Road Home, where we're going to look at the life of Paul from after his third journey to his death, and we will have studied through the entire life of Paul. But starting today, we want to look at his third journey. Now, his third journey really begins properly in verse 23 of Acts 18. But there's some information before verse 23 that provides an overlap. And I want to make sure we understand the overlap. So I want to begin in verse number 19 of Acts chapter 18. And here's what it says. It says, they, and we'll learn in a moment, that's the Apostle Paul, and a married couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. They came to Ephesus. Now, where did they come from? Well, they had been in Corinth. Paul spent nearly two years towards the end of his second journey in Corinth. Then he and Aquila and Priscilla sailed across the sea to another major city called Ephesus. And it says that Paul left them, Aquila and Priscilla, in Ephesus. Now, that's important. Because when we get to verse number 24, Luke is going to take us back to Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus. And we're going to meet one of the most intriguing individuals in the book of Acts. But let's keep looking about what happens with Paul. It says, now he himself entered the synagogue in Ephesus and he reasoned with the Jews. And that was Paul's pattern. Every city he went to on his journeys, he first goes into the Jewish synagogue. He tells the Jewish people in the synagogue that Jesus is the Messiah, that he died for our sins, rose from the dead, and that salvation is not about obeying the law, it's about putting your faith in Christ. And in most synagogues, when Paul gave that message, what happened? He was run out of the synagogue. Often, he was run out of town. But the synagogue in Ephesus is different. Notice what happens. It says, when they asked him to stay for a longer time, the Jews in the synagogue said, hey, we want to hear more. Paul did not consent. But taking leave of them, saying, I'll return to you again if God's will, he set sail from Ephesus. So it appears that the Jews in Ephesus are open to the gospel. But Paul doesn't stay there. Why? Because he has Aquila and Priscilla. 
Because you see, folks, the church on the move is not about a certain pastor or a certain missionary or a certain apostle. The church on the move is about you, every single person being used by God. So what does Paul do? Look at verse, well, before we get to that, let me back up. How did Paul first meet Aquila and Priscilla? Well, he met them back in Corinth. If you go back in chapter 18 to verse 1, it says this. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he would spend two years. And he found a Jew there named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Now, why did Aquila and Priscilla leave Italy and come to Corinth? Because Claudius, the emperor, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So they end up in Corinth. And Paul came to them because he was of the same trade. He stayed with them. They were working together, for by trade they were tent makers. So how did Paul first meet this couple? Well, he met them back in Corinth. He started working with them. They were all tent makers. So now they were a three-person factory making tents in Corinth. And there's no doubt that as they worked together, Paul shared with them the truth of Jesus. They put their faith in Christ and they became key ministry partners with Paul. In fact, they weren't just key ministry partners at one point, And we don't know the story behind it. I wish we did. They actually saved Paul's life. How do we know that? Well, when Paul ends his writing to the book at Rome, the church at Rome, in Romans 16, Paul says this. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who for my life risked their own necks. So this is a couple who was very special to Paul. He worked with them as tent makers. They became ministry partners. At one point, they even saved his life. And he leaves them at Ephesus so he can finish that second journey and get things rolling on journey number three. And we read about that beginning in verse 22 of Acts 18 when it says, When Paul landed at Caesarea, which is a coastal town of Israel, he went up... And greeted the church. He went up. He went up where? Well, if you're in Israel and you were going up, where were you going? Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem sat on a hill. It was the highest point there, highest city. No matter what direction you went to Jerusalem, you were going up. So Paul leaves Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus. He sails to Israel. He goes up to Jerusalem. It says he spent some time there with the church. And then it says that he ended up going to Antioch. Antioch was the church that set him out on his journeys. This ends Paul's second journey. He's back in Antioch. He gives a report. And now it's time for Paul to venture off on journey number three. And it says, having spent some time at Antioch, he left. He passed successfully through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So here's Paul. His third journey has begun. He's traveling to all the churches he had started on previous journeys. And while he's doing that, who's back in Ephesus? Aquila? And Priscilla. So here's what happens. At this point, Luke changes the camera scene from Paul back to Aquila and Priscilla. And beginning in verse number 24, we're going to see what happened in the ministry of Aquila and Priscilla while Paul was out traveling to all these churches. And it's amazing because Aquila and Priscilla are going to meet, I think, one of the most intriguing men in all the New Testament. In fact, if I could listen to one person in the New Testament preach... It would be this man. I would rather listen to him than Peter or Paul or John. His name is Apollos. 
Look what it says in Acts 18, verse 24. Now, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. Now, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That sounds like a good resume if you're looking to hire a pastor, right? He's eloquent. He's mighty in scriptures. Well, let's break down who this man is. The first thing we learn is his name. His name is Apollos. And that's interesting. Because the Bible says he's a Jew. But he's a Jew named Apollos. Why is that interesting? Because he's named after a Greek god. Here's a Jewish man. Mighty in scriptures. Who's named after a Greek god. That tells me that. This man, Apollos, had a very well-rounded background. It wasn't just a Jewish background. There was also a Greek background. He would have been what we call a Hellenistic Jew. A Jew greatly influenced by the Greek culture. And the reason he was influenced by the Greek culture is because he lived in the city of Alexandria. He was born and raised there. Now, Alexandria was in Egypt. It was part of the Roman Empire at the time. In fact, the city of Alexandria was the second largest city in the Roman Empire behind only Rome. It was a city known for its intellect, known for its philosophy, known for its Greek culture even. In fact, there was a university at the time of Apollos in the city of Alexandria that was the largest library in all the world at the time. Nearly 700,000 volumes were in this library in Alexandria. So there is no question that here's Apollos and he's very well educated, not just in Jewish things, but also in the Greek culture. In fact, it says that he was mighty in scriptures. Now, the scriptures there is talking about the Old Testament scripture. The New Testament hadn't been compiled yet. It's the Old Testament. Now, here's what's interesting. What's interesting is this. There was a large Jewish population in Alexandria. In fact, historians estimate that anywhere between a quarter and a third of the 600,000 people that lived in the city were actually Jews. There were Jewish synagogues everywhere in the city. Now, by the way, I think that connects us back to the Christmas story. I know my mind's already on Christmas. I'm sorry. Why does it connect us there? Because remember where Joseph and Mary and the Christ child fled when Herod was trying to kill them? They fled to where? Egypt. Did they just live among non-Jews? No. More than likely, they ended up in Alexandria, which was a predominantly Jewish environment. In fact, before the time of Apollos, in Alexandria... They translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. It's a translation called the Septuagint. Septuagint means 70. Because there were 70 people that worked on it. And so even at the time of Apollos, not only is there the Hebrew scriptures, but there's also the Hebrew scriptures that have been translated into Greek. Just a little sidebar. This is one of the reasons why I think it's quite possible that Apollos wrote the New Testament book of Hebrews. Because the New Testament book of Hebrews uses a more classical Greek language and it quotes from the Septuagint. And so here's Apollos. He knows the scriptures in Hebrew. He knows the scriptures in Greek. Not only that, the text said he was eloquent. Do you realize He's the only person in the Bible described by that word. No other person in the New Testament is described by the word eloquent. He could speak. 
Paul's not described that way. In fact, Paul's described just the opposite. He was weak in his oratorical skills. Not Apollos. Apollos was persuasive. Apollos was an amazing communicator. You would not want to debate Apollos because you would lose, right? When I was a kid, there was a financial investment firm called E.F. Hutton. And their slogan on all their TV commercials, and if you're my age or older, you can finish this. Their slogan was, when E.F. Hutton speaks, what happens? People listen. Well, guess what? That was true of Apollos. Man, when he spoke, people listened. So up until now, he seems like an amazing guy, and he is. But let's keep reading about him. Verse 25. It says, this man, Apollos, had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. Again, up until that moment, it seems really good. But then another phrase is added. It says, he was acquainted with, only with the baptism of John the Baptist. So what else do we learn about Apollos? Well, we learn that he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, which was an Old Testament term, meaning the things of God. The things of God as seen in the Old Testament. In fact, that phrase, instructed in the way of the Lord, goes all the way back to the time of Abraham. Not only that, it says he was fervent in spirit. Now, that's not talking about the Holy Spirit. That's talking about his personal spirit. Fervent means boiling over with enthusiasm. So listen, do you want to know how incredible this guy was? Not only did he know Scripture, not only was he eloquent in presenting it, but he was enthusiastic. I mean, this guy would have been fun to listen to. And some of you are thinking, why couldn't he be preaching this morning? But nonetheless, that's who this guy was. And it says this. He was teaching accurately what he knew about Jesus. What he knew about Jesus, he was teaching accurately. Here's the problem. His knowledge of Jesus was incomplete. How do we know that? Because it says he only knew the baptism of of John. Chances are really good that at some point Apollos had run into a disciple of John the Baptist. And as a result, he believed what John the Baptist taught. He was even baptized in the ministry of John the Baptist. Now understand that the baptism of John the Baptist was a baptism of repentance preparing you for the coming of the Messiah. And John even went as far as to point out who the Messiah was. So what was John's message? His message was prepare because the Messiah is coming. And then he pointed out Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There he is. The Messiah is Jesus. And Apollos believed that. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And because of all of his knowledge about the Old Testament, he could prove it from Scripture. He could look at the prophecies in the Old Testament and show you how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. But his knowledge about Jesus ended with the teaching of John the Baptist. John died before Jesus was crucified. John died before Jesus was resurrected. So here is Apollos. He's got a lot of good knowledge, but he doesn't have all the knowledge. He's acquainted with the baptism of John, but not the baptism of Jesus. Now, how is the baptism of Jesus different than the baptism of John? Well, again, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance preparing you for the coming Messiah. 
The baptism of Jesus was identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It was saying, I'm not just preparing for the coming of Messiah. I believe Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm putting my faith in his death and his resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins. Right on cue, right on cue. John did not know about that. John, Apollos did not know about that. He only knew about the baptism of John. So imagine Aquila and Priscilla as they go into the synagogue in Ephesus. And here's Apollos, best speaker they've ever heard. And not only that, in the synagogue, he is declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. And Aquila and Priscilla got to be going, where did this dude come from? He's amazing. But as they listen to him speak, they realize his knowledge about Jesus is incomplete. He doesn't understand what the Messiah did. So notice what Aquila and Priscilla do as we pick it up in verse 26 of Acts 18. It says, Apollos began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I love what Priscilla and Aquila do. And by the way, because Priscilla's name here is mentioned first, it would seem she's the one that was kind of initiating this. They go to Apollos and they say, really enjoyed your message. Why don't you come over to our house for dinner? And every pastor knows to beware when that happens. So here's Priscilla and Aquila. And they sit down with him and they say, man... You are so articulate, so eloquent. You know the Old Testament. You so beautifully taught and showed that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, can we share with you some things maybe you don't know about Jesus? And Aquila and Priscilla give to him all the information about what Jesus did when he died on the cross, rose from the dead. What happened on the day of Pentecost. And now here's Apollos. And he now understands the totality of the gospel. It's here, no doubt, that he identifies with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Realizing that you're not going to get to heaven based on obeying the law. But rather based on putting your faith in Christ. And all of that happens when Priscilla and Aquila come alongside this eloquent preacher and help him to understand more accurately. By the way, there's a couple things I want you just to note. Would you note, first of all, how Priscilla and Aquila went about it? Because in today's culture, if you heard a preacher preach and his message wasn't totally, completely accurate, you would just go on Facebook and declare him a heretic to all of your friends. Priscilla and Aquila didn't do that. They privately, graciously took him aside, shared with him. Folks, listen. Constructive criticism and correction is needed. But constructive criticism correction will only be effective if it's shared privately and graciously. And that's what Priscilla and Aquila do. They privately, graciously share with him the rest of the story. And you know what I love about Apollos? He's teachable. This man who could win any debate he was in was teachable. He listened. He learned. He accepted it. And how do we know that there was this change in his believing? Well, look at this. It says, when Apollos wanted to go across to Achaia, where Corinth was, the brethren, including Priscilla and Aquila, encouraged him. They wrote to the disciples back in Corinth to welcome him. And when he arrived, 
Look at this. He greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Apollos now gets it. The whole story is that Jesus isn't just the Messiah. But as God's Messiah, he died in our place to pay the penalty for our sin then defeated sin and death when he was resurrected and now offers to us a right relationship with God and an eternal home in heaven through grace. He gives us what we don't deserve because we put our faith in him. It also goes on and says that in Corinth, he powerfully refuted the Jews in public. When he debated them, he shredded them. He shredded them. Demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And I love that. Folks, it's not enough to give people your opinion. You need to be able to show them your opinion in scripture. He didn't just say, here's my opinion about Jesus. He said, let me show you from Scripture who Jesus is. By the way, Apollos would go on to become a very important person in the ministry at Corinth. In fact, he became so important, so loved, that there ended up being division in the church. The division was based on personalities. Paul had to address it. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12. Paul says, Now I mean this. Each one of you is saying, I follow Paul. After all, he's the great apostle. Oh yeah? Well, we follow Apollos. He could whip Paul in a debate. Oh yeah? Well, we follow Peter. He's still the rock. Oh yeah? Well, you go ahead. We follow Jesus. Nah, 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 nah. And there was that kind of division happening in Corinth that shows that Apollos had become pretty prominent. In fact, if you drop down to verse number 4 of chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians, listen to what he says. Paul says to them, What is Apollos? What is Paul? We're just servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity. I planted the seed in Corinth. Apollos watered the seed, but it was God that was causing the growth. Here's what I love about the story of Apollos. What I love about Apollos is I meet a lot of people today who are trusting in their religion to get them to heaven. They're trusting in their religious activity to get them to heaven. They're trusting in their religious knowledge to get them to heaven. They're trusting in their religious heritage to get them to heaven. They're trusting in their religious sincerity to get them to heaven. And folks, understand this. If we're going to grade someone on religious activity, religious knowledge, religious heritage, and religious sincerity, Apollos will top the list. He was highly involved in religious activity before he met Priscilla and Aquila. He had incredible religious knowledge before he met Priscilla and Aquila. He came from an amazing religious heritage Before he met Aquila and Priscilla. And he had religious sincerity. He was fervent in spirit. Before he met Aquila and Priscilla. But if there's one lesson. I think we need to learn from this story. It's this. Listen. No amount of religion. Can get you to heaven. Without Jesus. No amount of religious activity. Can get you to heaven without Jesus. No amount of religious knowledge can get you to heaven without Jesus. No amount of your religious heritage can get you to heaven without Jesus. No amount of religious sincerity can get you to heaven without Jesus. Apollos had to come to the point that he understood what Jesus did for him. And how because of that, Jesus wasn't just the Messiah, but by being the Messiah, Jesus is God's only way to heaven 
And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father unless they come through me. Maybe today you're sitting in one of our campuses or watching in one of the groups that watch us. Maybe you're watching at home, online, or through the TV at a nursing home or hospital or laundromat or a restaurant or a prison. Maybe you're watching this morning and you've been trusting your religion to get you to heaven. Here's what I want you to know. No amount of religion can get you to heaven. Only Jesus can get you to heaven. And if you've never put your faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And right where you're seated right now, no matter where you are right now, maybe driving in the car, listening on the radio, you can put your faith in Jesus right now. You can say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. And I believe you are the only way to heaven. And right now, I put my faith in you. And the Bible says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And if this morning, wherever you are, you're making that commitment, I'd love for you to let me know. If you're at one of our campuses, on your card, under that prayer request part, you can just write, I put my faith in Jesus today. That's all, all you need to do. If you're watching online, on our online portal, there's a slide on the screen right now that you can click to say, I just put my faith in Jesus. If you're watching through another means, wherever you are, you can send an email to me. Let me just give you my personal email. It's scott d at myefree.org. Scott d at M-I-E-F-R-E-E dot org. Just email me and say, Pastor Scott, I put my faith in Jesus today. The story of Apollos is an amazing story of a man who was religiously active, had a great religious heritage, had religious knowledge, had religious sincerity, but didn't know the full truth about who Jesus was. And when he learned that truth, it changed his life. Jeff's going to take over up at our Sioux campus. The Sponibles down at our classic service. Here in the main auditorium, would you stand with me, please, for prayer? Father, as I think about Apollos, I'm amazed at the qualities he possessed. And once he truly put his faith in Jesus, how you used those qualities as part of taking the church on the move. You're the one, Jesus, who told us to be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, to the uttermost parts of the earth. So, Father, we want to be active as a church in taking your message to people like Apollos and others. We don't want to do it for the fame of our church, for our attendance numbers, or statistical reports, but for the sake of lost people who need to know the message of Jesus. May we be your witnesses. May we be a church who's always on the move. May evangelism be the engine that drives our church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.